Software engineering isn't going anywhere. AI isn't going to magically replace engineers like a lot of people think, because here's what people are missing. The job isn't disappearing, it's evolving. Think about building anything complex, like a bridge, a building, a skyscraper. You need two kinds of people, the ones who can swing the hammer and the ones who can read the blueprints. Someone has to figure out what to build, how the pieces fit together, what can go wrong, and that's what's happening with software engineering right now. AI is becoming really good at the construction, at writing code, but it can't be the architect, it can't design the system systems, it can't make the big decisions about what to build and how it should all fit together, it can't even reason outside its context window. And trust me, most industry problems don't fit in the context window of an AI. So look, in 10 years, AI will write a lot of code. All the boilerplate, all the repetitive stuff, but here's what it cannot do. It can't decide what to build, it can't look at a messy business problem and figure out the right technical solution, it can't make trade-offs between speed and reliability, it can barely reason across different code files, let alone massive code bases, it can't tell you if you're even building the right thing because it doesn't think it just does so if you're a computer science student right now here's the shift that you need to make you need to stop thinking like a coder and start thinking more like an architect because in the future you're not going to be hired to write every single line of code you're going to be hired to break down vague problems into clear technical plans to understand relationships across large code bases to design how different parts of the system talk to each other and to make decisions when there's no obvious right answer and of course you still need to understand what makes code good or bad whether you wrote it or AI did. And here's my rule of thumb. When I'm coding something, I like to ask myself if I could do this in an interview. And if the answer is yes and it's something that I'm confident in, then I let AI handle it. But if it's something that might even slightly trip me up on the spot, then I decide to do it myself. This way I'm not missing any fundamental knowledge, but I still get to leverage AI's efficiency. And honestly, this is all way more interesting than just coding. You're solving the actual hard problems, focusing on the building rather than just monotonously learning syntax and language rules. And even before AI, the best engineers weren't the ones writing the most code or even writing the best code. They were the ones that were making the smartest decisions about what to build and how to build it. AI is just making that a lot more obvious. So yeah, the future of software engineering isn't just coding, it's leaning more towards a software architect role. So don't worry about AI taking your job. If anything, it's just going to make it evolve. 80% of the results you want come from a small 20% of the things that you do. And for most CS students, that 20% is just one thing, actually coding. Not watching tutorials or YouTube videos like this, not procrastinating on making a project, not doom scrolling on your phone, just actually sitting down, opening your editor and building something. Think about it like a bodybuilder. If you wanna build muscle, your 20% is lifting weights. That's the part you need to focus on because everything else is secondary. Yeah, of course, nutrition is gonna matter, sleep matters, but if you're not actually actually in the gym lifting, none of that other stuff is going to do anything. And it's the same with software engineering and computer science as a whole. Because I think most students are solely focused on going to class and attending lectures and doing your homework and getting the degree, when unfortunately all of that stuff should really be secondary in the current job market. So if you want to actually thrive as a software engineer or a student studying computer science, you should spend 80% of your time actually building something. Because that's that small 20% of your entire pie that matters the most. And everything else like the networking, resume polishing, leak code, the tutorial watching, trying to get a 4.0, all of that is the other 20%. It's the icing on the cake. It helps once you're already in the rhythm of actually writing code and building something. But if you can't build, then none of that stuff really matters. But once you can, that's when you start investing in all of the other things. Then you polish your resume, then you network, then you grind leak code, then you optimize your LinkedIn. Because now you actually have skills to market. Now you have projects to show. Now you have knowledge to talk about in interviews. But if you do it the other way, if you spend all your time networking or all of your time just solely on classes, you're either gonna be really generic or you're just marketing nothing for yourself. You're selling a product that doesn't exist yet. So figure out what your 20% is, the thing that will actually get you closer to your real goals and make it 80% of your focus. Everyone's always talking about having imposter syndrome where you're not actually bad, you just kind of feel like you are and it's all in your head. And yeah, imposter syndrome is real, but sometimes you're not dealing with imposter syndrome, you're just objectively behind. If everyone around you has internships, research experience, club involvement, cool projects, and you don't, then you're behind. 
That's not imposter syndrome, it's just reality. But here's the wake up call and the good news. Most students are way more behind than you think. I was actually at a career fair last week and it shocked me to see that so many students in my grade level are still using things like Canva for their resume and only have maybe like three or four projects. And these aren't freshmen, these are juniors and seniors competing for the same roles as you. So even if you are actually behind, the bar is really shockingly low, which means it's actually really easy to get ahead of most students. You don't need to be exceptional like the people you see on LinkedIn. You don't need to be a genius. You just need to be more consistent than the average. If you spend a few months making some good high quality projects and then you get active in one of your school's clubs, or if you can be a research assistant in a lab, or if you just commit to open source or participate in hackathons, you'll already be ahead of 95% of computer science students. There's this advice you hear all the time in tech. Don't worry about learning everything, just learn it when you need it, which is what I call just-in-time learning. And honestly, for a working engineer, that's good advice. If you need to pick up a new framework for a project, yeah, learn it as you go. If you need to use a new library, read the docs when you hit that task. But here's where I think a lot of people have gotten this twisted. I think students have turned this into an excuse to skip the fundamentals or even skip trying to learn altogether, which is a huge problem because there's a massive difference between I'll learn this AWS service when I need to deploy something, and I'll learn how a hash map works when I need them. One of those is acceptable to not know at the top of your head, but the other, I mean, pretty much everyone in computer science should already know. And so if you skip the fundamentals and you end up in an interview, let's say they ask you to optimize a function and you don't even know time complexity, and you can't even tell if your solution is good or bad, well this time you can't learn it when you need it because you need it right now, and you don't have time to learn it. So here's a good rule that I'll leave you with. Just-in-time learning works for tools and technology technologies, but it does not work for the fundamentals. Learn React when you need to build a front end, sure. Learn Docker when you need to deploy, cool. But for stuff that you need to learn now, you need to know how arrays and hash maps work and all the different basic data structures. You need to learn big O complexity. Basically, whatever role you're going for, you need to really hammer in on the fundamentals and don't fall in the trap of thinking that you'll just learn it when you need it because that time may never come. You may never need to learn something until you're actually in an interview and they ask you a question about it. And so the the best way that I like to learn these topics is with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver. With thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI, Brilliant is a learning app designed to be uniquely effective. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, which is a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Brilliant also helps you build understanding from the ground up, and it has a perfect mix of engaging problems, competitive features, and daily encouragement which all keeps you motivated and on track. Plus, all content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, Google, and more. And learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do, both for personal and professional growth. And Brilliant keeps you on track to reaching your goals one day at a time. And Brilliant's growing collection of programming courses is a great way to build timeless problem-solving skills to thrive in the evolving world of programming. From learning Python to developing and intuition for computer logic, you'll get hands-on experience with real programs and learn to think like a programmer. So to learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash lattice. Scan the QR code on screen or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. So once again, huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And thank you to all of you for watching this video. It really means a lot to see everyone that has kind of joined this community and have had similar experiences as myself. And I'm glad that I'm able to have an uplifting impact and inspire some of you. So I hope this video was helpful and thank you.